Well, I've been treating leukemia patients on the faculty at MD Anderson since 1991, a long time. Some of you were probably in diapers. Uh, and this is a thing of Kaplan-Meier survival curves by decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And while the plateau has slowly inched up a little bit, probably more due to supportive care measures rather than treatments, you'll notice that the median survival has budged very little over 40 years. We are still using the same basic therapy that they came up with in the 70s today. And so there's, while CML, chronic myelitis leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, AML to a certain extent, there's been big gains in those, and we've really moved the survival curves up in those. AML still remains a huge problem. Okay. Now, recently, uh, AML was one of the TCGA uh, diseases that was studied, and there are about 23 common mutations, and we know that there are several recurrent translocations in large-scale genetic events, loss of the whole chromosome, gain of the whole chromosome. And these occur in uh, some patterns. Some of these are associated with others, some of them infrequently with others. But there's tremendous heterogeneity. While everybody's got some translocation or genetic event, or most of them do, and everybody's got a couple mutations, the way it with these mix and match is extremely heterogeneous. And so this creates a huge problem of how do you treat this when there's so much heterogeneity and how you got to AML in the first place. So the dogma has been that you could target these events and that that would improve outcomes. But to take advantage of that, you need to have a druggable target for each of those events, and there isn't necessarily one. Um, and so you might have to look elsewhere, up or down the pathway, as we heard about uh, in the talk from Dr. Califano. Um, but with all the combinations, you also need to know how to combine the targeted therapies to deal with you know, an endless series of combinations. And we can't do clinical trials in each of these because some of these things just occur too darn rarely. Okay? There are also a, a plethora, uh, which is a word with a somewhat negative connotation. We've got so many drugs coming down the pipeline. And scientists have invested their whole careers in figuring out the pathway and the molecule and coming up with a drug for it. Um, and we're going to throw these away because we can't target them correctly. In a typical phase two study, we treat 15 patients. If 3% or 5% of, of the population respond to a particular drug, the chances are very good that none of those patients make it onto your limited phase two study. So you toss away a drug as inactive merely because you didn't treat enough of them. Whereas if you could have predicted a priori who the patients were that you wanted, a drug that only works in a few percentage of patients could be recognized, okay? So to do that, you need a way to target the pathway or match the right agent to the right patient. And you need to know their pathway utilization for that. And the pathway utilization may or may not correlate with mutation events cleanly, but we felt that reverse phase protein array would be a way that we could do this. So we generated a reverse phase protein array. This is uh, an image from my desktop of the Excel spreadsheet as far out as I could go. And I could still only get half of the data set onto the, the screen. So it's a big data set. Uh, as Amina pointed out, we put up a portion of it uh, that was more homogeneously treated, and we got rid of the patients who died very early from heart attacks and pneumonias and other things who really didn't have a chance to respond. Um, but huge data set. Uh, and we've characterized this with 231 antibodies, as she mentioned. And in combination with uh, Amina and Wendy and Dave, who are in the back there someplace, we have now come up with a way to make uh, network-based analysis out of this. And we can recognize, again, recurrent protein expression signatures that should probably lend itself towards targeting uh, the right drug to the right patient. And so we wanted to put this forward with the idea of seeing, could everybody else do better than we've been able to do? Okay. Now, I want to point out, having shown you that it's a huge number of numbers, and I realize that this was all fun and games with numbers to you guys, but each row on that data set is a person, some still living, some dead. And they don't think that they're a number. They think that they're patients, okay? Um, and I asked uh, the patient who gave me this clock, she gave me this when she was five years out from transplant, if I could use this at this talk. And she was thrilled at the idea, and she wanted to use her picture as well. So here's her, she's 12 years out, 10 years out from transplant, and what I want to point out are the pictures in the background of her kids at life events 
and her grandkids that she would never have gotten to see if she hadn't been treated and hadn't been cured. Um, the second question, you know, questions two or challenges two and three had to do with time and how long people live, or live. And you might ask, well, how much does a little bit more time mean? This is a picture that uh, this gentleman's wife sent to me a week after he died. And I was kind of kicking myself uh, after he finally died. He'd been my patient for 16 years. And she sent this to me along with a really nice letter telling me that I should feel really good about all the time I had given him and not that he had finally passed. And I think her comment at the top here, he got to grow to see three of, you know, live to see three of his grandkids, highlights the importance of this. And so when you work on these data sets, I guess as a clinician, and I may be one of few in the room, um, these are patients and these are real disease and these things matter to these patients. It's more than just the numbers. And so, you know, it's great to have the numbers and it's great to do the challenge and be the best. But think of the biology behind it, think of the patients behind it, and let that be a motivation to you. With that, let's go on to the winners. So for the first challenge, uh, to predict uh, which AML patients will achieve complete remission and those will be primary resistant, Lee Lu, who's hopefully here someplace, there she is, come on up. So she's from Arizona State University, uh, a football team that uh, uh, did quite well to go along with their academic uh, achievements. Uh, she's going to give us a talk in a few minutes about evolution-informed modeling to predict AML outcomes. Okay, and for challenge two, um, predicting uh, complete remission duration from uh, Tsinghua University, hopefully I didn't, Stanford. and Stanford. It's not from both? Okay. David's gonna talk, but we have people from both. He was from Tsinghua, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Zhilin Yang, uh, Subarna Singh, and David Dill from those universities, and they're gonna talk about outcome prediction using dic dictionary learning uh, for sparse coding. So. And the final challenge was to predict overall survival time for each patient uh, from Ontario Institute of Cancer Research and the University of Toronto, Ziwa Lin, uh, Gregory Chan, who's going to be talking today, Hong Li Zi, Jeffrey Hunter, and Paul Boutros on a bag semi-parametric model to predict survival time for AML patients. And I've never heard AML referred to as all my love. <laughs> First talk is going to be from uh, Lee Lu. There's one more um, announcement. Huh? Oh, the hackathon winner. I'm sorry. I didn't know about that. It's Roland He from Stanford University. Um, but we don't have. We uh, don't have a certificate, but we're happy. <laughs> 